Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined by Bernie Stone of Stone Custom Drum. Bernie, how are you? Uh, I'm doing okay. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Thanks for being here. Um, we are talking about your involvement with the classic American brand Slingerland in light of the recent acquisition of Slingerland uh, by DW Drums. And um, I want to say right off the bat that this has never happened before, that I was recommended in the same day by two people, Steve Hatfield and Rob Cook, both same day said, you need to yeah. talk to Bernie. So I know something right is happening. But yeah, why don't you just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement with Slingerland and uh, and take it away. Okay, well, you know, as a young young man growing up taking drum lessons, uh, some of my first drums were secondhand drums, and among those were Slingerland. I get actively playing, and uh, by nature, uh, I I'm interested in how things are made. And I acquired an old Radio King snare drum, and uh, eventually become friends with a gentleman named Charlie Donnelly. And this was way in the early days of when Modern Drummer came out. And Charlie was a consultant to the magazine back then. So I got a great education on the history of Slingerland from Charlie. And then eventually got into the collecting thing like a lot of us are today. You know, we fast forward a little bit. You know, I get out playing and uh, as a working musician. Uh, I started really picking up drums and building them and refurbishing them and and that led to me getting a part-time job at Columbus Pro Percussion, which I became the guy who did the repairs. And, you know, I did that for a couple of years. And I worked with Jim Rupp, who's a jazz legend drummer, and Bob Brighthop, who is a uh, dean at Capital University. From there, I started finding myself doing, you know, really special projects for uh, percussionists, uh, marching bands. Uh, schools, then that started leading into doing a lot of custom finish work. And early on, I discovered, you know, just from knowing people in the industry, discovered the Keller shell. Mm -hmm. And that led to doing a lot of custom snare drums and so on and so forth. Well, after being at Columbus Pro Percussion for a couple of years, some of us older guys, we know the Percussion Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Well, Neil Graham, the proprietor of the percussion center gave me a call one evening and said he'd like to talk to me about coming here and working. After a little bit of negotiation, I found myself at age 22 moving to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and immediately, I'm, I mean, I'm talking from the day I walked into the door in 1984, my responsibilities were dealing with high profile touring bands. Um, doing special projects for Tama, for Ludwig, uh, some of the some of the largest drum corps, uh, you know, largest universities. That stuff was my responsibility. And I did that for about, I believe I was employed there until 1990. Hmm. So, you know, after the percussion center had some problems later on, uh, Neil Graham decided to keep the manufacturing portion of that. And I more or less found myself unemployed. So I started running ads in Modern Drummer, you know, custom drum work, you know, Bernie Stone call me. And I did that for several years, uh, well into the 90s, about 92, 93, and had a little shop at my old house, uh, 24 by 24, two car garage, had it set up as a little custom shop. And I did a lot of stuff during that period. Well, having a young kid and having a, uh, kind of working for myself, and at the time I was playing quite a bit, the opportunity to take a corporate job came up, which I did. And then shortly thereafter, I, I landed a premium playing gig, which I still have today. Hmm. Well, the corporate job I took because it had benefits and so on and so forth, so I started really laying off of the custom stuff. Well, fast forward to around 2001, come home from a gig one night, and my guitar player sent me a message. Hey, did you see this on eBay? And it was uh, the Slingerland equipment. Mm. <laughs> and so I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And of course, I didn't really know what I was looking at. What I did know is I seen similar equipment 
in use at the Ludwig factory back in the 80s. I actually went to Chicago one day and walked in the front door and said, hey, can I take a factory tour? And they're like, what? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so some, some old man about 80 years old took me around. I spent the whole day at Ludwig That's just awesome. walking around looking at stuff. And hmm. one of the things that fascinated me most was the drum shell making assembly line. And I remembered looking at that going, I have to know how this works. So when I'm looking at this stuff in the eBay ad, uh, I'm going, you know, that's exactly what, like what I seen at Ludwig. Well, anyhow, the original listing that we looked at, I believe the reserve is thirty thousand hmm. dollars. And wow. I'm going, well, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's not something you, yeah, that's no. not something you put in your garage, no. <laughs> you know. And it got up to about twelve or thirteen thousand dollars, if I remember right. So, you know, it goes off no reserve. It comes back on, and then I seen. Uh, the reserve was $10,000. Well, it got up to about $9,000 and went off no sale. Mm. Well, a couple of weeks later, it went up at no reserve. I go, oh, now you're talking. Yeah. So, you know, of course, I like like usual, I didn't really ask my wife for permission. Of course I not. started bidding on this stuff, right? <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, I won it. Huh. And uh, they called me right away and said, were you just bidding on this or did you intend to buy it? I said, well, I intend to buy it. And the guy says, okay, well, it has to be off of our premise December 21st. I go, dude, that's Saturday. This is Thursday. <laughs> he says, if you don't want it, I'll relist it. And I said, okay, I'll be there. Yeah, once again, this, did, this didn't go over well with my wife. No. Jeez. And, well, let me ask you, though, like before you go on, 2001, you said, right? Why were they selling this stuff at that point in time? Do you know what happened? Like the factory, like it was just sitting in an old factory then? Uh, yeah, actually, I can tell you exactly what it was. Uh, the reason my guitar player was following these listings is he's a Gretsch guy. Mm. He was seeing this stuff that was being listed by a company called Musical Closeouts.org or something like that. And every once in a while, he would see Slingerland stuff. Well, as most of us know now, Fred Gretsch had bought the Slingerland name, assets, and holdings and it was in Ridgeland, South Carolina. Well, he said every once in a while that they would show Slingerland stuff, and then this stuff popped up. Mm. So I, you know, uh, make arrangements with the uh, the guy from musicalcloseouts.org. Uh, had to pay for it before I got there with certified funds, and it had to be off the premises December 21st. First of all, I said, well, where do I need to go? And he'd give me the address, whatever it was, Kings Highway, Ridgeland, South Carolina. I go... Dude, that's the Gretsch factory. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, you are to understand that you are not purchasing this from Gretsch. This is from musicalcloseouts.org. Oh, my gosh. And I go, okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> so, so I had a buddy who was a truck driver. He said, that's not, that's, he goes, that's about a 12-hour drive. I've been there before. Yeah. Yeah, so I rented a truck, uh, drove it down to Ridgeland. We get down there, spend a night. We go to the factory and pick it up and... Uh, there's another guy there. He bought some older drum shell manufacturing equipment, Slingerland's uh, production stuff from the 1920s. Wow. And yeah, Jeez. and we got to talk and then, you know, he, uh, he bought that stuff and I bought the uh, radio frequency stuff. So anyhow, uh, get the stuff, get it back to Indiana. I don't have a place to put it. A buddy of mine who's an electrical engineer says, well, you can put it in my pole barn and uh, we'll take a look at it this spring. So spring comes along and uh, he was a plant engineer at Dana Axel Corporation. And he said they use a lot of, a lot of similar equipment in heat treating and metal forging. And when he was in the Navy, he was a uh, microwave sonar and radar technician. So he knew a little bit about it. And the first thing he said to me, he's, he says, well, I hope you didn't pay too much for it because something this specialized, you have to know how it works mm -hmm. and you don't have a schematic diagram and you don't have an operator's manual. He said, but you do have about $7,000 worth of scrap here. Oh, God. Wow. So at the very worst, I could have scrapped it out and got my money back. Well, spring comes along and we're looking at skids of stuff. You know, the only thing that you could really recognize were the radio frequency generators and the molds. 
And it took us a couple of months to figure out what parts went where. Okay. So, you know, summer goes by and we're into the fall. We've got one machine kind of assembled and it works on industrial three phase power, which we didn't have, but we figured we could run it on single phase. Well, Jim calls me one day and says, I need you to come out here. I got something to show you. I get out to his pole barn and he's got the machine up and I noticed there was, there was wiring going to it. And he says, flip the switch. And I flip the switch and the tubes come on. It operates on tubes. And I go, wow, that's pretty cool. He goes, well, do you know how to make drum shells? I said, man, I don't have a clue. Well, that started the process of, well, drum shells are made of wood. Where do you get the wood? Hmm. So we get into the end of the year and I, I kind of figured out that buying veneer was a learning experience. I actually found a, a guy here in Fort Wayne that had a cabinet shop and he had a whole, whole skid of veneer. He sold me for like 70 bucks, hmm. you know, four foot high and 10 feet long. So I started by putting veneer into the molds and, and gl glued them up with just regular wood glue. And, and the way the process works, there's a, there's a inflatable bladder that drops down inside. You put air pressure to it and you're supposed to get a drum shell. Well, every time I turned the machine on, it would, all the red lights would come up and it would say plate overload and nothing. And, this went on for a year, year and a half. Could never get it to do that without going into an overload. I'm about two years into this, and it was failure after failure after failure. You know, we knew how the machines went together. We could get them to turn on, but you, you put wood and glue in it. And so I started, you know, started digging around on the internet, and I couldn't find anybody that knew anything about manufacturing with radio frequency. What I could find was uh, the company that manufactured these machines. Mm -hmm. I called them. They thought they had the schematics to them. Uh, they spent a couple of weeks looking, and they informed me that uh, those were on microfilm, and they had a company fire a couple years earlier, and of those were burned up in the fire. Jeez. But she did say, she did say, I do know that uh, Slingerland had three of those machines, and so did the Ludwig Drum Company. Well, yeah, I made a phone call to Ludwig, and they weren't real interested in talking to me. No. Well, here, pause for a sec. Can you tell yeah. us how are radio frequencies used to actually make a drum shell? Yeah, let, yeah. Let me let me give you a real dissertation on that. Uh, what you're doing is you're taking you're taking raw wood, and if you know anything about woodworking, the moisture content is everything. So to have a stable wood piece, the moisture content needs to be 4% or below. Well, a lot of situations where I get it, it's much higher than that. Well, radio frequency is great for that. Plus, you need a glue, and the glue has a catalyst in it that responds to the radio frequency. And what the catalyst does, it distributes the, the radio frequencies equally through the glue, hmm. through the glue line. And the way, the way this works is uh, every other piece has a glue line in it. And if you're making plywood, of course, to have your grain run the same way, it, it's an odd number of panels, okay? If you're using six plies, you have to invert one of the panels in order to make the grain run the correct way. And I can elaborate on that later. Well, anyhow, uh, you, you dimensionally cut your wood, you put it into the mold, you glue up every other every other panel, uh, the bladder drops in, uh, you inflate it and you have to have a certain amount of, uh, amount of PSI for this to all work. Okay. You can't just put it in and inflate it to something. And, uh, you have to have a known PSI and some of this stuff is real proprietary and mm -hmm. I, I won't elaborate on that. Sure. Once you get your stuff into the mold, uh, like I said, you've got up to a five minute cycle time and, you have a microwave oven, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when you put your food in? The plate doesn't get hot, but anything that has moisture content gets hot. Mm. Well, radio frequency does the exact same thing. Uh, the radio frequency passes in a sine wave through the load in the mold, and what it does is it cures out the glue line. It doesn't heat. It doesn't heat. Heat is a byproduct of the process. 
And heat is a byproduct. Steam is also a byproduct. So what comes out is a piece of uh, molded molded wood, uh, formed molded plywood. And when it's done, it should have a relative moisture content of less than 4%. And the glue lines are glued out. And it's actually the best way to manufacture uh, multiple pieces of wood. Like I had said before, I started looking for everything I could find about radio frequency on the Internet. And I'm about two and a half years into this, and uh, I talked to some guys online, and they they give me little tidbits of information, but never enough to really help me. And a lot of this stuff, there's a lot of math involved. And I stumbled across a paper from the Library of Congress, Hmm. and it had something to do with uh, a plywood company that helped uh, engineer this process in the late 1930s, and... The process was for making flat plywood, because prior to World War II, plywood was done in a cold press. And uh, the the Weyerhaeuser uh, Wood Company somehow got involved in this process, and it was to make uh, plywood for like the D-Day landing craft and Mm -hmm. for stuff for the military, because they knew knew that it was going to be a war pretty soon. And this information at one time was classified and top secret, which I thought was kind of interesting, you know? So... You know, after World War II, uh, manufacturing with radio frequency became a real common process in a lot of industries, most likely the wood industry. Uh, and what's involved is uh, it's make, used for making molded plywood products, which we hardly do any of in the United States anymore. And what you do is you take your, uh, your, your wood panels, you press them together, and most molds have a male and female part and you sandwich the plies and the glue between the, uh, you know, the, the forms, and then trim out your piece when it comes off. And it was used commonly for making uh, molded plywood products. Now, to make a drum shell, it's a little similar to that, except uh, your male and female part is your, your mold, your exterior mold and your bladder. So I started piecing all this together, and uh, believe it or not, my... Uh, my daughter, who was in middle school at the time, was helping me, helping me with the mathematics because it has some complicated math. Yeah. Yeah, what I was able to figure out is uh, no matter what you're making, there's a, uh, there's a formula for uh, load resistance. And load resistance has, uh, has to equal uh, Ohm's value and so on and so forth. And that was actually real crucial to know because one day I had my daughter out at the shop looking at this stuff. She said, dad, did you see this? I said, what? And she found, she found some mathematical equations on the inside of one of the machines. And I said, what is that? She said, well, this is a, this is an input formula for voltage to uh, resistance to ohms. And mm-hmm. it gives you a, gives you a, a maximum power output rating. <laughs> and I'm talking about a 10 year old kid. Wow. This out. So, like I said, I started putting things together with uh, the mathematic formulas I found in, in the Weyerhaeuser document and what my daughter was able to teach me. And, and then, you know, I get some news from my buddy, Jim, that he's retiring, selling his farm, and I needed to move my equipment. So I had to disassemble everything, move it out towards New Haven, Indiana, and I set up shop in the old uh, International Harvester Factory. It's like a big industrial park now. And I'm, I'm in the center section of it in about 5,000 square feet. Well, anyhow, I get set up out there. And, you know, we fast forward to about 2008, 2009. And my kids are getting older. Uh, the demands of my corporate job are, are much less. And I've got a little bit of spare time. Uh, I get out there every night trying to, trying to make drums. And I'm, I'm still failing at this, right? Mm-hmm. So one night I'm out there waiting for my kids to get done with soccer practice and had a couple hours to kill. And I put some wood and glue into the molds, filled them up. And then I thought, well, you know, this thing has to work because I'm just doing something wrong. And, well, you know, you're, you're, into, you're into sound engineering. Mm-hmm. And believe it or not, I thought, well, when a, when a sound engineer walks into a room he's never mixed before, he EQs everything flat. Uh, you know, he, he neutralizes every setting on the board, mm-hmm. and then he works from there. 
So everywhere that, that I knew there was a calibration on a machine, uh, I put it to right in the middle between zero and 10. And I thought, well, well, we'll start there. Did the whole thing like I've done at least 200 times before, wood and glue, inflate the bladders. This time I hit the switch and no red lights, all green lights. The gauges come up and it's, it's just making this humming sound. And I'm going, oh my God. <laughs> and then I, then I put my hands on the mold and I go, oh man, it's getting warm. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, these machines have a five minute timer on them. So I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, watching the timer. And it clicks off and the mold's warm. I go to take the bladder out. And I'm going, oh man, the bladder's glued to the inside of the mold. It, 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 and I literally, I literally had to puncture the bladder to get everything out. Mm, wow. Well, from there I knew, well, I know how, I know, I know this thing works. So, so I started really looking on where to get wood, glue, so on and so forth. I uh, did a little bit of research and found out that there are certain glues out there uh, that you use with radio frequency, and there are certain glues that you don't. Well, right around the corner from where I'm at was a guy who had a glue factory. So I walked in there one day and said, look, uh, I've got this radio frequency stuff. Uh, he goes, yeah, this is what you need. He gave me two gallons of glue and said, take this and try it. <laughs> and he explained to me that uh, it has a catalyst in it. If it doesn't have the catalyst in it, it won't react. Mm. You'll end up with a mess, which is what I had. So I took the glue, uh, got into my skid of wood, and dimensionally cut everything. And uh, believe it or not, man, that was the first drum shell. Wow. It came out pretty good. So I started making shell after shell after shell. And then I said, well, you know, piecing little pieces of veneer together, you, there's got to be a better way to do it than this. And eventually, you know, my contacts led me to a, a place that does rotary cut veneer. You can buy it raw and have it cut to your specs. And then when I stumbled into that, I started making some pretty nice shells. Uh, the problem I was having, though, was, like I said, the drum, the machines have a five minute timer on it. I know it works, but I don't know how to calibrate the machine for each drum shell size. Uh, sometimes it would take me an hour to make one drum shell. I said, man, there's no way you ran a production with making one shell an hour. So during this period of time, I got with the Indiana Center of Small Business Development. I started Stone Custom Drum as an LLC, and I started the process to get the black oval. And I went to my first NAM show. I maybe had 25 shells and fly out to Anaheim. I got a booth. I've got a table and I stack them up on the table and got a banner hanging up. And so I come in the next morning and my shells are scattered everywhere and I got fingerprints all over them. I'm like, what the hell? So I'm in the, I'm in the booth, you know, and people start drifting through. And so I've got my little story. I'm telling, you know, well, you know, I make drum shells and I thought there was an alternative to what's out there. And, and they would inevitably ask, well, did you make these? I'm, yeah, I made them. Well, how'd you make them? I said, well, I purchased the original Slingerland tooling. Man, they, their eyes get real big. The next thing you know, people are coming over and they're, they're wanting to know the story. I said, yeah. And then I think Rob Cook was among them. He says, I had no idea you were the guy who bought this. He says, you know, everybody wondered where it went from the old eBay auction. And I said, well, I've had it for some time and it's taken a while to put it together and make shells. And now here I am. Well, this was 2011. I kept going back to NAM every year and year. And first I started doing drum shells and then I did snare drums. And, and after the first NAM show, I, I did a few shells for, uh, well, I actually landed a big account for a company called Colibrand. And I was building uh, banjo ukulele shells for them for a couple of years. Cool. And yeah, that was, I was doing okay with that. And yeah, I'd get a lot of guys, you know, who were doing the Keller shell thing, looking for something different. And I underestimated, I, I assumed the need for boutique type shells was much larger because I were, what I was getting a lot of was one of this, two of that, one of this. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to do that. You yeah, know? sure. So I thought, well, next year I'm going to go back with snare drums. So I did. 
And guys are like, well, I didn't know you built drums too. Well, yeah, you know, I've got a deep history in drum building. Well, I ended up getting with some marketing people. So we started marketing Stone Custom Drum. By this time, I'd secured, I'd secured a trademark for the Black Oval and, and that, that had no challenges, uh, no opposition. Uh, you know, at the time, Gibson had owned Slingerland. So I researched all that heavily and I found out that, you know, that was open and available and was in a case of abandonment. And my thinking was, well, you know, I have a lineage to Slingerland. I should, you know, I should run with this. Yeah. You know, I'd also like to point out it was never my intention to be to be Slingerland or be just like Slingerland. I just wanted the I just wanted the heritage aspect of it. And to this point in time, that's what I feel like I've done. But you know, I should probably I should probably back up a little bit. A- after my first NAM show, I told you I'd, I'd had some issues with making drum shells in five minutes. Mm-hmm. I just got back from the NAM show, and a guy called me and said, "Hey, I understand you own the original Slingerland tooling." I said, "Yeah, that's right." And he goes, "Can you describe it to me?" I go, "Well, it's two Reeves RF generators. Uh, they're about yay wide, yay big. Uh, I've got a whole series of molds and bladders. They look like this." And he goes, "My God, that's it!" And I said, "Yeah, why?" He goes, well, I'll have you know that when I was in college, I worked at Slingerland for a couple of years. I go, really? He goes, yeah. I go, did you ever see this equipment in operation? He goes, yes. I go, did you ever operate any of this equipment? He goes, no. Mm. Do you know anybody who's ever operated this equipment? He goes, yes. I go, is that person still alive? He goes, yes, that person is my dad. And he ran a wood shop at Slingerland for 22 years. I said, I need to talk to your dad. <laughs> I go, do you live in Chicago? He goes, we live in Chicago. So I, I headed over to Chicago. I met Jim, uh, took him some shells. And then uh, I showed his, showed his dad, who's a very nice gentleman. I said, these are the machines I have. I have questions. So I started asking him and he would say, have you ever done this? I said, yeah. He says, well, when you do this, you got to do this, this, and this. So I started really taking notes. And he says, does the machine ever make this noise? I say, yes. He goes, when it does that, you've got to do this, this, and this. And like I said, I started putting everything together. And when I, when I got home from that trip to Chicago, I drove straight out to the factory, uh, put some wooden glue into the molds. Bam. I was knocking them out in three minutes. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Jim Moritz's dad had a couple of the key pieces of evidence that I needed. And, you know, I I may have stumbled into that later on, but, uh, the stuff he told me was crucial in order to, to run the shells the way I do. That's funny. I should say that that's Jim Moritz, uh, who was on a very early episode that everyone can check out. Uh, I think it was called growing up Slingerland and it was in the first five episodes. Um, so that's Jim of Chicago drum, great guy, great family. Um, so carry on. Just want to give Jim a shout out. Oh yeah. Well, uh, this same year, like I said, I just got back from Nam and just got some crucial information from Jim, Jim and his dad. And then uh, Rob Cook calls me and and he says, you know, uh, you haven't been to the Chicago Drum Show in a while, and would like to have you here. And I said, well, I was planning on coming this year. And he goes, well, good, I'll get you a booth set up. And would you like to, you know, give a presentation on on the equipment? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I did that and that kind of, you know, everything starts snowballing after, after this. And now everyone knows that I have the Slingerland equipment and I'm getting more of these boutique guys who want shells. And, and so I'm doing okay. And what I'm finding out is now I've got two machines up and running and I'm running out of space and I'm making a little bit of money and I'm buying more equipment. And, uh, I actually moved into a larger space at the industrial park. Then I go to another NAM show, and this time, you know, I've got drum sets. Man, I've got a full booth. Looks really, really well. And I'm up, up in the middle where everything's happening, and I'm picking up more and more clients. And things have gone that way ever since, pretty much. That's how Stone Custom Drum come about. Uh, the ultimate goal for me was to, uh, you know, have a brand that represents 
you know, not only do I have the, the DNA heritage of a great American company, but I'm also not stereotyped as that, that I'm doing my own thing. Mm-hmm. I believe I've kind of successfully done that because really, you know, I, I've got things that we started to refer to that nobody else does. I refer to the three ply shell with the reinforcement rings as, as a Chicago style shell. Then I started doing the Nile style shell, which is a five ply maple poplar. And, and since, I, since I started referring to the Nile shell, you know, those two terms have become synonymous with my company. Now, not only that, I have several other shell platforms that I do. Uh, I've got a seven ply that, you know, is based around a solid cherry uh, center core with razor thin mahogany. It ends up being seven ply. And, uh, well, and along with that, I've done a lot of, uh, you know, hardware fabrication. The ultimate goal for me is to have everything, every nut and bolt manufactured in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of goes with that old school, uh, you know, the way drums used to be where things would obviously be, you know, done a lot more in house and not done as much overseas. Um, and they're beautiful drums, um, which I recommend everyone goes online to your website, um, and checks them out, which that's stonecustomdrum.com, Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah and, and there's some really cool pictures. Um, it, it's wild how this is from the factory and just how you found how Jim's dad was the guy who could help you because he had to be there because yeah. there was no other way to figure this stuff out minus your 10 year old daughter (laughs) you know yeah you you know first of all um i really love history and knowing that i own a crucial part of american drum history is huge for me Mm -hmm. and you know building my own brand and and having that dna legacy is also huge for me um you know with the recent purchase of the Slingerland brand name from Gibson by DW. And I didn't know why for the last couple of weeks, but man, my website has been get has been getting hit real hard along with my Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And then when the news broke, I guess it was two weeks ago, Monday, man, I found out like at eight Oh five in the morning, probably right after it was announced, several people hit me up and did you hear this? Did you hear this? And so I'm like, well, that's interesting. Well, yeah, let's talk about that because I'd love to get your opinion on that because obviously, um, well, let me ask the first question. Was the Slingerland name something you ever went after acquiring? I know you've said you wanted to do your own thing and be your own company, which you've successfully done. Did you ever want to try yeah. and become actually, Slingerland? Actually, yeah. I looked into it very seriously, and what I found out was uh, – of course, we know we all know how Gibson was mismanaged and nearly run into the ground. Uh, I, I actually had people in place at, at high levels that were feeding me information on all this at Gibson. Mm. So I got some inside information about it, and plus all the all the documents that you could actually find if you research it online. And what I found out was uh, the the brand name Slingerland was tied up. Uh, in, in liens, I guess you would say, Bank of America actually owned it. Uh, we actually contacted Bank of America, and, and the way my attorneys explained it to me, they'll have a big garage sale of this stuff. If whoever had it originally, you know, goes into failure or default. So we tried looking at it at that angle. And then, uh, as we all know, uh, uh, J.C. Curley stepped in. Uh, they restructured Gibson, and from what I understand, Gibson's doing pretty good right now. They sold off a lot of stuff that was dragging them down. Uh, some of that was uh, the warehouse in Arkansas, where a bunch of the Radio King stuff was stored. Hmm. <laughs> from what I understand, they had no idea they even owned that warehouse. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's how much in disarray it was. Yeah, it's such a, I mean, Gibson's a mega company. Slingerland was a large company. I, you know, that's kind of weird. They don't know they have that stuff, but I could see that where it's like, oh yeah, you can see that, you know? Yeah. Now in the last couple of years, I've been relatively quiet about everything. Like I mentioned, I took a corporate gig and two years ago I was severely injured on the job and I've had two major shoulder surgeries and it nearly cost me my business because uh, at the time I was doing a lot of volume through Sweetwater mm-hmm. and, you know, without 
getting real into it, I ended up losing Sweetwater and I had about 50 grand out and man, it nearly, it nearly destroyed me. Yeah. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm huge on the history thing and to lose this equipment as a business failure would have been real painful. Mm -hmm. And, but the, the easy thing to do would have been go bankrupt, let the bank sell everything off, you know, change my name, move to Fiji, never be heard <laughs> from again. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, I, I take the hard path. So in the last couple of years, I managed to sell off almost all of my pre-built inventory. You know, at one time, I, I was able to have 10 guys on the shop floor. Uh, right now, it's just Jeff and myself, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. it was pretty hard hit to take. Oh, sure. And, but but <laughs> uh, things are looking real rosy right now. Uh, in the last week, I've had several, several people uh, come at me about investment capital. And oh. so I'm, yeah, I'm looking at uh, bringing in investment partners and expanding. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Cause I guess, you know, I think when Slingerland or any company is in the news, you're in the discussion and the, cause it's the real deal equipment. Um, now then the question would be, what's your take on DW doing it? What do you think? How do you think that's going to go? What do you, what do you think about that whole thing? Actually, you know, my situation isn't too unlike DW's humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you remember um, they had they had what they thought was Camco, and they got into a legal battle with Tama. And it, as the way it turned out, you know, DW ended up with uh, the hardware and all that stuff, and Tama just ended up with a name. You know, it's kind of that same situation. You know, DW makes a makes a fine product, and in the last couple of years, they've They've got a huge distributorship that yeah. there are several brands that fall under their umbrella. Uh, you know, John Good has been very good about, you know, how they market DW. That question's come at me, and I'm, I'm not really sure what to really think about it mm -hmm. other than I know DW makes a, a high-end product. They make a nice product. They had humble beginnings like myself. Sure. And then I get a lot of this, well, maybe you should work with DW. Well, that's something I would consider. Now, be quite honest with you, I don't know that John Good even knows who the hell I am. Yeah, you don't, I mean, that's that's a tough, they've got a lot going on, obviously, but I'm thinking maybe they'll look deeper into uh, the Slingerland stuff like that, or maybe they'll just say, we've got the name, we're going to try and match the quality and build it in a similar way, but um, did Slingerland always use the RF shell production? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mentioned earlier on that uh, when I got down there, a guy had purchased the uh, the old uh, cold form stuff. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. the way the way yeah the way that process worked was they they took a large you know a large tube mandrel and they just wrapped three plies around it and then uh, wrapped a piece of canvas around it and let it sit till the glue dried. Wow, slow I mean, process there, I'm sure. Obviously. Slow process, yeah, <laughs> and that. The way I understand it, and this was from Jim Moritz and his dad, was that system was being used up until about 1956 or 7. Wow. Uh, Jim's dad was a little cloudy in what year they actually got the new RF equipment. And Jim's dad also confirmed with me that they had three machines, okay? Uh, and he pointed out that the two machines I have were the best ones. <laughs> That's good. And... Yeah, and I also pointed out to him that I have what I think are the remnants left over from a third machine. I have several parts and pieces that I know went to a different machine. So now Jim's dad also pointed out that one of the machines went to Shelbyville, Tennessee, and for a while they built drums down there. And the way I understand it, they were three-ply with oak reinforcement rings. Okay. So the only thing I can you know, demise from that is that, you know, that, that didn't work out so well. They got the machine back and, uh, took it out of commission. And that's why I have spare parts. Well, it's good to have a donor, you know, like donor uh, parts. Yeah. Cause I don't yeah. think, uh, you're going to get on Craigslist and find, um, parts for your <laughs> Slingerland, uh, RF machine sitting around. Well, you, you know what, <laughs> uh, the, the funny thing is, 
like I mentioned, in the 50s and 60s, this was real common technology. Today, it's not so common and to find anyone who knows anything about it. Uh, they're either those guys are either in their 80s or they're dead. Yeah. So uh, hmm. I probably I probably become the, the country's foremost leading authority on manufacturing round plywood. Now, now, with that being said, you know, one of one of the things that was real fortunate that came my way was about a week after I got back from meeting with Jim Moritz. I got a phone call and this guy says, hey, I need somebody to come over and tune a drum set for me. And I, I go thinking to myself, good Lord, I can walk you through that on the phone, dude. Yeah. He goes, no, I got this drum set for my kid and uh, I saw your ad and uh, how much do you want? I'll pay you whatever you want. And I surely thought, well, nobody will give you a hundred bucks to tune a drum set, right? So I said, yeah, how about a hundred bucks? He goes, can you be here at noon tomorrow? I said, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, I find out he lives about a mile from me. So I'm walking over, and it's a pretty exclusive neighborhood. And walking up the driveway, there's a Ferrari in the garage. <laughs> I'm going, man, I should have charged him more money. <laughs> we get down to his uh, basement, and it was a Pearl export kit, and you know, with the with the Paul Jamison rack and stuff. And you know, I set it up, and there's a nice array of Zildjian symbols and. You know, he says, well, yeah, I paid like 2000 bucks. Did I get a good deal? I said, yeah, man, it's a great deal because there's $3,000 worth of Zildjian. Yeah, the here, symbols. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I put them together and tuned them up, and I'm sitting there kind of looking, and I spotted a couple pieces of electrical equipment. Then I spotted an RF meter, and I said, hey, uh, I don't want to be nosy, but what do you do for a living? Well, he says, I'm an electrical engineer, and I specialize in microwave, radar, and uh, radio frequency. I said, radio frequency? He says, yeah. He says, uh, mainly uh, security systems, satellite systems, RFID tags. I go, do you know anything about this? I got my laptop out and showed him some pictures of the insides of one of the machines. And man, his eyes got really big. He says, those have tubes in them. I said, yeah. He goes, when can I see it? I go, anytime you want. Yeah. So it turns out, you know, you're familiar with invisible fence, the yep. dog fences. Uh, this guy basically invented it. Whoa. And yeah, he, he's done really well for himself. So uh, this guy's a successful entrepreneur, and he sort of took me under his wing. And when he's seen the machinery, he goes, uh, he goes, you know, I have an idea on how we could do this with another machine. And so we started building solid state machines. And I use them for... Uh, I use them mainly for really large bass drums, uh, bass drum hoops. And then we build a machine where uh, we use RF and we have a handheld unit that I glue the reinforcement rings in oh, cool. so they don't have to sit all night. Yeah, that's awesome. You're uh, kind of modernizing the process. Um, it makes me wonder how many shells could Slingerland have been pumping out per day with the old RF well, machinery? Yeah, Jim, Jim Moritz's dad told me... Uh, uh, on a good good day, man, he could make a hundred uh, hundred shells a day himself. Wow! And if you got three machines in operation, you know you're knocking out three hundred shells a day. That's that's some serious demand. Yeah, exactly. And this would have been at the peak of that kind of like Gene Krupa drummers or the celebrity kind of uh, era, right? But what what I'd also like to point out is I can do stuff that fast also. But let's step back in time. Uh, the build quality on a lot of that stuff isn't like the build quality that I'm expected to produce. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, build quality is much more, you know, much more proficient nowadays. When you're competing with uh, hand-built stuff and stuff like, say, what DW and Ludwig produce today, I mean, it has to be top-notch. Yeah. So, me cranking out 100 snare drums in an afternoon, well, I could do it, but you know, the yeah. quality is not going to be there. Jeez. Yeah. You know, one of, one of the other things I do is, uh, I do a, you're familiar with the old Brooklyn style Gretsch. Yep. I'm an OEM manufacturer for a company who sells, sells those type of drums. And they hit me every once in a while with big purchase orders. And I've actually, I've actually run 65 shells in a six hour period, start to finish wow. myself. <laughs> And that's 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 cutting the wood, making the shells, 
uh, sanding them, and putting them in the box. Oh man, it's just you better focus and get it done. <laughs> yeah, that particular shell is really hard to make because you have to steam bend. You have to steam bend the maple first. Mm. And yeah, well, one of the one of the other things with the uh, radio frequency equipment is instead of taking days and weeks for a uh, steam bent piece to cure out, you can do it in fifteen minutes. Gosh, you can cycle. Yeah, you can cycle it three times and it's done. I mean, again, that's just so cool. And, and, uh, it helps you stand out to, by using that process as kind of your thing. Cause if no one else yeah. is doing it, that's really cool. Um, well, I was going to say that the only two companies in the world that are even doing it are myself and Ludwig. So Ludwig still uh, does it. Is that correct? Yeah. Down in a row. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Cause I've, the, the, the process of creating the actual shell. I know a lot of companies don't even do it. They use Keller. They use things like that. So it's it's cool to know that. You know, the DW process is real similar to what Tama and what they were doing at uh, Sakai. And those molds are heated like a George Foreman grill. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they put a, uh, a heat set type of uh, resin in with their wood panels. And that's how they're done. The big difference is, you know, you're baking something in that situation more or less. And what I'm doing is, you know, I'm passing radio frequency through it and I'm actually drying the product and drying the glue line at the same time. Hmm. So those would be the main differences. That's interesting. Well, um, as we wrap up here, I should tell people that they can, um, like I said before, they can find you online at stonecustomdrum.com. And I'm assuming you're going to be at the Chicago Drum Show this year yeah. again, yeah. which will be the 30th uh, anniversary. Um which is in May of 2020. So um, that's where you and I met originally. And um, I think people can find you and check the drums out and uh, and all that good stuff. And just to wrap up, I think from what I heard, it sounds like there's not hard feelings with the Slingerland thing. I, to, in my opinion, it's better that it's just going to come back rather than sit in limbo and just be in you know the closet of Gibson forever. Right. I don't know if you agree yeah. with that. It's just, it seems like it's such a shame for it to be wasted. Well, everyone's familiar with DW. Yeah. I, I think, however they approach it, you know, whatever their Slingerland product will be, you know, will be a, a nice top notch product. Yeah. You know, it might not be a period correct like mine. And like I said, you know, I, I never set out to be Slingerland. Yeah, exactly. I'm just happy to have a, lineage to the company dw stuff i'm sure is going to be great i hope they do it right and it's not like sometimes you think of like a band who broke up 30 years ago coming back and starting to release albums and it's like it's never quite i don't think i think slingerland's got it's 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 history and it was there and then what happens in the future will be it'll be new slingerland and i mean rogers is coming back with new rogers stuff so it's well i was i was going to point that out that you know the new rogers stuff is really pretty nice yes and, yeah. You know, it's not quite exactly like the old stuff, but I don't know. Do you really want it made like it was in 1965? Exactly. It's That was then. This is now. Like so. I said, today we expect better build quality out of everything. So. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, again, Bernie Stone, Stone Custom Drum. Um, Bernie, thanks for being on the show today. I've had a blast talking with you and learning about your process, and uh, it's fascinating. It's science, right? Uh, yeah, actually, there's a lot of science involved, and uh, anyone who wants to uh, set themselves apart from being just a boutique Keller guy, uh, no matter what you're doing, look at look at the science, go back to your physics classes, and whatever everybody else is doing, uh, look at that with a skeptical eye, and you know, design your product around what you know, what you're good at, and basic science. Yep. Science and history are the two things that have kept me through this whole thing, just yeah, churning away at it. So Perfect. Well, this show's all about history, and uh, this falls right in there. So, All right, Bernie. Then I will, uh, I will see you at the Chicago Drum Show in May, and uh, we'll get some pictures with the drums. And um, thanks again for being on the show. Look forward to seeing you then, and I'm pretty excited about hearing the podcast. So. Oh, yeah. People are going to love it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Bart. 
I want to give a huge shout out to my good friend, Afonso Pene of Delta Percussion in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, he pretty much instantly became a top tier patron on the Patreon page. Also, shout out to his wife, Simone, his father-in-law, Manuel, who started the drum shop. And uh, he's got a baby girl named Elena on the way. So if you're in Brazil, in the Rio de Janeiro area, you should head over to Delta Percussion. Uh, it's been around since 2006 has one of the largest selections of drums, heads, sticks, everything percussion in that area, um, and it's just a big family. So head over there and tell them that Drum History sent you. 